Welcome to Shaw Talk, and I'm your host, Tiffany Shaw. For many of you, you already know, but for those of you who are new, we host three segments, one being local celebrity, the next being youth spotlight, and the third being healing hearts. In this week's show and for the rest of the month, we are looking forward to and hosting a show that's specifically around Black History Month. And so our youth are here representing something really positive about Black History Month as well as the rest of our guests. And so we're really excited. I like to start with the youth spotlight specifically because, well, they have a lot of energy and they're doing really great things. So we have some outstanding youth from both Armstrong and, Robin, and Robbinsdale School District as well as Cooper High School and Robbinsdale School District. So we have four youth representing the civil rights research tour and I'm gonna let you introduce let them introduce themselves to you today um, as they can tell you a little bit more about themselves what school they're from their names and what grades they're in so let's start with you Sean Hi, I'm Sean I'm a sophomore at Armstrong High School I am Mariah and I am a junior from Cooper High School my name is Laverne Shelby I'm a junior and I attend Cooper High School my name is Kalia Perkins. I'm a senior and I attend Armstrong High School. Wonderful, thank you. And as I said, all four of you are members of the Civil, Civil Rights Research Tour. And I just want you to tell us what exactly is that and how do you become a part of it? Well, this is my first year. All three of them have already been on it, but my teachers told me that it's a great opportunity. And when they told me about it, I got really excited. So Sean's new. Mariah, can you tell us maybe a little bit more about what exactly it is the you know the research tour and what do you do so this is my second year and the civil rights research tour is basically we're going to different states different cities to figure out what happened um, during the civil rights research well during the civil rights era and then basically finding information on things that happened and artifacts and stuff Wonderful. Um, and Laverne, how did you get involved? Because that was one of the questions. So how did you get involved? I think it's your second year as well. How did you get uh, involved? It's actually my third year. Oh my um, goodness, third year. Okay, yes, learning new things. <laughs> um, I got involved from two equity specialists from Robbinsdale Area Schools. Um, and why this is important is because we have to go back in our past to move forward in our future. Um, I joined because I was nominated by one of the faculty at my school, uh, Mr. Fisher, and uh, I just wanted to be around like-minded people who wanted to wear, raise uh, black and white awareness. Wonderful. And so it sounds like every one of you had to be nominated to this group, and there's a little uh, commitment to being part of this group, and I think Sean being newer, I don't know if you want to tell us what part of the commitment you remember. What, what, what is the commitment to be part of this group and to go on this tour? Well, so far, I've been going to the meetings every Wednesday and Thursday for the past month, and I mean, it's, it's fun. It's not really a hard commitment to make. Wonderful. Is there any additional commitment, Mariah? The commitment is basically being there on time, participating in all of the activities that we are doing to build ourselves up to be, basically, we knowing what's going to happen when we go. So like ideas of what's gonna happen when we go on the trip and all that. So learning about the history so you know what you're gonna see on the trip. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, did I steal it, Laverne? Uh, no, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> okay, so while we're on the trip, we have to gain all this knowledge and all this information so we, we, can, we can retain it and bring it back to Minnesota and work on our movie and our presentation. Wonderful. And Clea, you were saying a little bit earlier when we were talking that that is part of the, the additional commitment. So you're preparing before you go on the trip. There's the trip itself. And then, you know, Laverne kind of alluded to there's this greater project that you do. Can you tell us a little bit about that project? Um, yes. Uh, we make a video when we come back, uh, which is basically about our experiences on the trip, uh, the places we visited, and what we want to bring back. and. Uh, how we want to incorporate that into our uh, district, which is mainly uh, trying to advocate for uh, ethnic studies. Wonderful. So I know Sean's at a disadvantage because you haven't done it yet, but is yeah. there a certain part of the trip that you're particularly looking forward to? I can't wait to go to Washington, D.C. again. I went there when I was in fourth grade, but I didn't really understand what anything was. I just knew the buildings look cool, so it's going to be nice going to see that 
Wonderful. How about you, Mariah? You've been on the trip before. Is there a certain part that you're looking forward to or something, a new perspective you're looking for? I am looking forward to going to Birmingham, Alabama, um, where the the church, the 16th, the 16th Baptist yeah, the Church, 16th is that Baptist it? Church, where the four little girls died for the bombing, mainly because it it was really surreal being in a place where such tragedy happened. Right. And so, just a really good, well, not a good feeling, but it's a cool feeling being in a place where something so crazy happens. Um, for me, um, I'm excited to go back to Tuskegee, Alabama, um, because for one, it's a real historical city. Yes, it is. Um, a wonderful mayor who wanted to become mayor when he was actually younger than all of us. Um, and they have a beautiful, beautiful campus, Tuskegee University. I have a feeling you plan on maybe going there one day. Possibly. Maybe, okay. Um, and I want to go back to Selma, Alabama to walk back across the Edmund Pettus Bridge um, because when I did the first time, there was just this wave of emotion that you don't get anywhere else. Um, and uh, it was just a great experience. Right, and on that point, Mentioning Selma, uh, I think all of us know that a movie came out named Selma and history of that remembrance and actually did just go see it on Tuesday. And that was one of the activities it sounds like the whole group. How many students, Sean, do you know how many students are in the group total? Is it 18? I think it's 20. 20 oh, students. Yeah, it's 20 now. So all 20 of you went to go see the movie. How did you feel about going to see the movie? Yeah, it, it brought out some emotions. Yep. Same. It was really emotional. Um, and then to actually seeing it was filmed there and then realizing for me, I walked across that bridge myself mm -hmm. and I was like, wow, it's really, it was a really weird feeling. Um, for me, it was uh, really, really crazy, just like what Mariah said, because we walked over the bridge um, and knowing that Martin Luther King uh, did all that things and um, all the things that people went through, like, um, uh, I forgot the young boy's name, but he got shot uh, trying to help his grandfather out. Mm -hmm. um, it was just crazy watching all that and knowing that we were there to visualize it. Oh, man. For me, it mainly brought back all the emotions that I felt going on the trip. Um, and like they had said, uh, walking across the bridge and being in Selma and just seeing other people reenact the things that we were learning about and uh, that brought out a lot of emotion. Mm -hmm. Now the one question we didn't practice, but you know there's always suspense somewhere, <laughs> <laughs> is there aren't just African American students in this group and do you think that it is important to have everyone involved, all races and creeds involved in remembering the civil rights movement and where we've been and where we're going? What do you guys think about you know non-African American students being part of the civil rights research tour? Oh yeah, because I don't just see myself as African American, I see myself also as white too, so yeah, I wouldn't have had an opportunity if they just let just African American students go. Right, me too, biracial in the house, so okay. <laughs> Mariah, what do you think? I think that it's good that they're getting other races inside of the, well, going on the trip, because if they don't know, then they can't come back and tell other people, because the big thing about the trip is we want to come back and share our knowledge with everybody. We want everyone to know what we're doing, what happened, because if you don't know, you don't know where you're going. Um, for me, I really think it is important um, because we, what's the word? We, <laughs> <laughs> we practice and practice and practice to try to get it out. That's why we need more races, because this is an important thing that happened in America. And if other people don't know, it's just like, why? So right. we need, that's why they need to know. Um, I think it's very beneficial that different races are involved, um, because it's not just uh, a black problem. Uh, it's everybody's problem. And if those who are in the dark about it have no idea what happened and how it affected our country, then what are we really doing? Perfect. 
Well, I appreciate you, and I know there's uh, some places that we can look up information for other people to learn about it, so we'll make sure we make a link for the equity specialist for Robbinsdale for people to learn a little bit more about what you're doing. And we will have a few of your colleagues back, your student colleagues back after the trip, because that's in March, after spring break. So in April, we'll have some of them back. We really appreciate you all and your input and sharing a little bit about what the Civil Rights Research Tour is, and we really appreciate having you on the show. So thank you all for your time. Thank you. So again, the youth are really involved in our community and these youth, specifically around Black History Month, are taking the opportunity not just for a few months, but for the entire year to learn more about the civil rights movement and their heritage and sharing that with uh, other students and other adults. And that kind of just goes right into our next guest, whom is Nikki Nikima Levy Pounds, and Nikima happens to be the director of the Community Justice Project and a law, direct, a law professor at the St. Thomas University. And so Nikima is an amazing advocate and, on law and on civil rights here in Minnesota, but also across the nation, and has been involved in uh, many of the movements across the nation over the past few years. And so I kind of will let her speak for herself, credentials included, but that and all the activities that she's been involved with. So. Welcome, Nikima. Thank you. Thank you for having me on tonight, <laughs> Tiffany. You're very welcome, and you are very active. Uh, it was, you, you know, I had to get you scheduled in advance so we can make sure you get here. And so I said I would let you kind of just let us know where you are. What have you been doing in regards to law and advocacy around civil rights recently? Well, it's a blessing to be here in honor of Black History Month, and also to be here in light of the guests that you have on the show tonight. So hearing about young people who are interested and engaged in civil rights is phenomenal. Yes. That is the subject matter that's nearest and dearest to my heart. Um, I'm a law professor at the University of St. Thomas and I'm also a civil rights attorney. Um, I work with young people as well in the community, particularly in St. Paul, through a nonprofit that my students and I work with the community to help found called Brotherhood Inc. And so Brotherhood works um, on behalf of and with young African-American men who've been in the criminal justice system or gangs, and we create employment opportunities for those young men uh, so that they're able to make a living wage and to give Precisely. back to the community. Well, so, that's, a, that's a gap area is, you know, pretty much if you have any kind of criminal background, it, employment's out of the question, and that's the one reason why they usually end up reverting back to previous lifestyle choices. So I love that you started that and that that's probably impacted many lives already. Absolutely. I mean, it's impacted my life because I get to work up close and personal with young people who have a lot of hope and potential, but who need access to opportunity. Precisely. And so when working with those young people, it reminds me of some of the struggles of our ancestors right. who've had to fight against oppression since arriving, you Precisely. know, um, <laughs> here um, in this land and then also the struggles of the civil rights movement. Right. We have had to buck up against systems that have been hostile in many ways right. um, to us, to our community, whether it's at times the public education system, right. other times it's the criminal justice system, and the challenges that we face in terms of gaining equal access to opportunity. So I work on a lot of issues like that, hand in hand with the community, training the next generation of lawyers to become exactly. freedom fighters, and to continue in the tradition of people like Thurgood Marshall, exactly. who fought hard to dismantle Jim Crow. And as you know, in Minnesota, um, it's the land of 10,000 lakes, but it's also a land of a number of racial disparities. It is. Um, recently, a study um, articulated the fact that we were the second worst state in the nation for African Americans. That is shocking. You know, when you shocking look around, and appalling, yes. it is shocking and it's appalling. Um, and I just don't think that there's any excuse no. for African Americans to fall through the cracks in a state that has so many resources and so much access to opportunity. So Perfect. we're trying to change all of that. Yes, and we are. Minnesota's ranked, you know, in the top five for employment states most often, most years. And to know that there's a huge disparity in who's actually accessing those employment opportunities is very disappointing. And so for you, you get to do the research and have the proof, the facts that say there is a disparity. You can't turn your cheek to this and you are on the front lines. And I know you've been across the nation and witnessing some of these disparities not only in Minnesota but across the nation. Do you want to speak towards some of your experiences so far this year and where you've gone? Absolutely. So um, as you may know, in November I had the chance to travel to Ferguson, Missouri. That was a very powerful experience. I witnessed young people standing on the front lines mm -hmm. as advocates, 
They were chanting, they were marching, and they were standing up against injustice, especially in light of the numbers of um, unarmed African-American men, women, and children who've been killed at the hands of law enforcement. Mm -hmm. um, seeing those young people and their tenacity and perseverance reminds me of the stories that I heard um, from the civil rights movement, the books that I've read, and it really inspired me to bring some of that activism and, and advocacy back to the state of Minnesota. I thought that I was an activist right. before heading to Ferguson, <laughs> but after seeing those young people on the front lines, after experience being tear gassed, I was there as a legal observer for the National Lawyers Guild. It definitely shifted my perspective in terms of what it means to be an activist. So once I came back from Ferguson, I got involved with the Black Lives Matter movement. Right. And we have um, been <laughs> a force to be reckoned with in the state of Minnesota yes, in terms have. of drawing attention to a lot of the disparities in terms of um, addressing issues such as police community relations mm -hmm. and in trying to hold our government accountable for making sure that it is ensuring equal opportunity for all citizens um, in the state of Minnesota. And I know you probably can't speak to it and you know better than anybody the legal aspects of it, but you know, the Black Lives Matter movement had a huge movement at the Mall of America, which did catch national news and you, you know, were part of that. Now I'm not gonna allege that you're a leader because you weren't, but you were, you know, legal advisor and have been a part of that. And there has been some backlash to Absolutely. that and being an advocate. And so you have now actually experienced the, you know, backlash that many strong, healthy advocates experience. Do you have any recommendations to youth that may, might be watching your parents or students on what they can do and legally what's, you know, what's their ability, what are their rights and how are they allowed to actually speak out and protest? Well, number one, um, our constitution guarantees freedom of speech. It's the First Amendment right. I traveled to Washington, D.C. recently and I saw the First Amendment written on the side of one of the buildings that talked about the right to free speech and the right to freedom of assembly. And um, on December 20th of 2014, 3,000 people headed to Mall of America to declare that Black Lives Matter, to chant, to march, and to sing, and to lift our voices against injustice. We had lawyers there, clergy, students, et cetera. Um, and it was a very powerful to see what Dr. King called the beloved community in action. Right. Um, I would recommend that young people continue to stay involved, that they use their voices, that they advocate, and that they not be deterred um, by people who are uncomfortable with agitation and civil disobedience. That was a hallmark of the civil rights right. movement. In fact, Dr. King was arrested more than 30 times simply for standing up for what he believed in. So that's going to happen, unfortunately, when you're it bucking is. against the status quo, but it's necessary if we wanna see change in our community. Absolutely, and I guess on that point, I guess, so, so you can inform some people, because I know there's a lot of young people who said, I would, but, I would, but, I would, but, um, it's very possible you could be arrested, but in your experience, for those people who are, are arrested in protesting situations and advocacy situations, do most of those follow through in actual completed criminal charges or usually no charges pressed? Like what, speaking to especially, you know, we need young people in the movement, what should they be expecting in that experience? You know, most of them would be terrified to get arrested and go home and tell mom and dad about that. Absolutely. I would say they should expect the unexpected. Right. Um, unfortunately, you never know how law enforcement or a governmental entity will respond to civil disobedience. Right. If history is any indication, <laughs> they will typically press charges as right. we saw um, with 25 people who were arrested at Mall of America, even though it was a nonviolent peaceful protest. Right. 10 of us were um, charged criminally for being so-called organizers or ringleaders of the protest. Right. I was one of those 10 people. And I find it really disturbing that um, governmental entities would abuse their power and engage in overreaching for a nonviolent peaceful protest. Absolutely. And so during the civil rights movement, there were children involved in marches in Alabama. Yeah. Some of those kids were arrested simply for marching and protesting and standing up for our rights. And those kids would actually call their parents and say, if I get arrested, mom, don't come get me out of jail because they realize that it comes with the territory of fighting for freedom. Right. No one wants to be arrested, but unfortunately we live in a time in which sometimes those in positions of authority overreact and abuse their power. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you have 
a particularly special outlook because you do have the legal and professional background and you can advise in a way that you know comes with merit. I think uh, there's been some you know, people have alluded to that there is weakness and not enough strong leaders in the movement right now. And yes, the movement is real. It's still active. There are still disparities in America. And so for people to really know their rights and have someone like you strong, I'm glad that you have the Community Justice Project and that you really are training young people in the legal aspects of civil rights and that they have a strong leader because we aren't missing them. They're out there. We just need to be recognized and the young people need to make their way to you. So we appreciate what you're doing in the community and ask that you continue. And yes, black lives do matter. So we thank you for your time and we hope to have you back soon. So thank you so much, Nikema, for your time. Thank you for having me and thanks for all that you yeah. do for the community. Thank you. So that goes straight into uh, our next guest, Nikema mentioned something about lifting our voices. And in Black History Month, we don't want to forget that many of our, you know, those that came before us lifted their voices. People like Ella Baker sang actually her way through the civil rights movement. And so our next guest um, was on The Voice. She literally lifted her voice and she has been using her voice to um, make music matter in Minnesota. And she was on The Voice. She got four chairs on The Voice, which I don't know if you're a fan of that particular show, but that is a big deal. So that four celebrity uh, vocalists thought that she was amazing. I think that she's amazing. But on top of that, we all know that our uh, local celebrity spotlight is all about talking to people about how do they manage their real lives on top of being an artist. And so this particular young lady is 25 years old, a professional, a mother of a beautiful five-year-old little girl, as well as being an artist. So we want to welcome Ashley DeBose as she talks to us about her upcoming album that's being released, as well as how does she manage her life as a mom, professional, and artist. So welcome, Ashley. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. I'm so happy to see you. I actually have to tell myself that I just saw you perform live two weeks ago, and it yeah. was pretty much the most moving thing ever. My husband was there, and I was like, this girl is it. Thank <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and um, we're picky. We are. We see a lot of artists, but your voice is just piercing. I mean, it's very rare now that you find someone with such quality, tone quality, but also to know that, you know, you do have a day job and you do have a daughter. How do you manage all of that? First of all, thank you. That's <laughs> so sweet. Um, I manage it because it's so true that it takes a village to raise a child and I have a strong support system. Um, so I'm able to, and I also work part time now. Um, before 2013 when I auditioned for The Voice <laughs> and did that whole thing, um, I was full time. So, and I was still doing music, but it was a lot um, difficult, a lot more difficult. But my job is very understanding and supportive of my dream. And so they that is um, helpful. <laughs> let me be flexible with my hours. So really, I just work with my team. So are there certain people in your life that help you manage between work and being an artist and being a mom? Yes, my daughter's father and his family. Um, my mother, I have dear friends who are down for the cause. Um, they will come if I need them at the drop of a dime to babysit. And um, I also have a personal assistant. She's a really good friend of mine. And I don't know what I would do without her. <laughs> like, sometimes she's like, Ashley, your head. I'm like, oh, yeah, my head. So, You're like, like, literally my head. Yes, yeah, I need that. So, um, yeah. I yeah, have those people. those people in my life as well. So they are lifesavers, mm -hmm. and we need those people that are supportive of our dreams. Right. And you have been chasing the dream for a while, and we kind of touched base for a moment about how important it is to remind people, especially, you said, putting Minnesota on the map. So mm -hmm. when did you start this being an artist journey? Um, so I've been singing since I was a kid, but I'd say I started when I was in high school and I started performing. Mm -hmm. um, that's when I was, I was going around town with Imani, Mami, and company. Mm -hmm. I went to high school with the girl. She was a, a junior. I was a senior. And her and her mom had Imani, Mami, and company where they would invite artists along with them and um, do performances here and there around the Twin Cities. And that was my foot in the door into performing and getting compensated for performing and uh, just kind of getting over some of that stage fright. Right. Uh, well, you said the key, getting compensated. There's right. a transition where you just perform to build a resume and then you get start getting paid. Yeah, yeah, I was told if you get paid, it doesn't matter how much, you can call yourself a professional. So I was a professional singer in, right. in high school. So that that's was a, exciting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so you know, that's when I, I started performing and then, uh, you know, like really performing. And in my freshman year of college, I did some recording, just amateur, mm -hmm. you know, using Pro Tools, which is a software that you right. can use right at home to record. So I was creating my own songs and I was really proud of them. And um, 
now I would probably get embarrassed if, <laughs> if a lot of people heard it, but I was really proud of it. And, um, you know, I, I always wrote, I wrote songs since I was about 10 years old. So um, when I linked with some producers later on, now this is about my sophomore, um, actually my junior year in college, mm -hmm. I was able to put together an album eventually, which would eventually release a day before I graduated from college. So I was- Very convenient time. Very, con <laughs> it, it was a lot of work, but I was so, um, now looking back, I feel so proud of myself and um, you know my team for working together to make that a reality for me. Like, cause when I found out I was pregnant, I was, a, I was 19 and I was a sophomore in college, it was not planned. And I was just like, oh my gosh, my, my life is over, my dreams, like look at them falling from right. the sky. Like, and then I feel like, you know, I, I'm spiritual and I really think God has his hand on my life and he's been providing and looking out for me and he would have it so that the very two things that I thought I was gonna be able to do, graduate from college and, right. you know, be an artist, I released an album and then the next day, less than 24 hours later, walked across the stage and got my degree. Well, that, wonderful. So. Little do you know, we'll have to send you the link that our previous Spotlight Youth Jail actually is doing a project about that. So uh, the mistake in a single story about teen moms, that oh. your life is not over. Right, right. And so I think you're perfect to follow, you know, the month after her. And that's why I kind of thought, you know, Black History Month, Ashley DeBose, you are yeah. a mother that is still accomplishing your dreams. And that is, being a mother is not a barrier for you. Right. You know, it might give you some, you know, different Pushback. peculiarities, yeah. but yeah, <laughs> you're still going to do it. Mm -hmm. And with that, this upcoming album is not your first. I actually don't even right. think it's your second one. What number album are you on? So, this, so technically it's my second album, but I did release a second project, um, and it was a, an acoustic version of my first project. Okay. So the reason I put, I put that out, um, I love acoustic music. I love when I like just have me and a guitar performing. I love my band performances too. But um, So I put that out, and it was kind of like a, in the meantime because I was going through the uh, Siri, the the process with the voice. Right. So in 2013, I was on the season season five of NBC's The Voice. Right. And um, if you go online, I, I, you know you can see how that went. I won't give it away, but right. it went really well. And uh, I was out there for a long period of time. And we, right. you know, under contract, can't release music until, during that time. Yeah, during that mm -hmm. time. Um, so I tried to hurry up and put something out before I signed the contract. And uh, <laughs> So it was fun. So yeah, this is my third body of work that I'm putting out. That you're putting out. Yes. And I can tell you that you have moving music. It's music with Thank a purpose, you. absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I think the uh, piece that you're going to sample for us, it really fits into the theme of the show today, which is Be You, right? Be You, yes. And actually, did you perform this too? Um, I, I did perform. Yep, that was the last song that I performed. So Be okay. You is the title track for my album, which is called Be You. And it will be re coming out March 7th. Right. I'll have a release show at the Bedlam Lower Town, which is in St. Paul, downtown. Wonderful. And um, it's a 21 plus show, and it'll be fun if everybody could come out and make it, and I can sing my heart out for everyone. And um, it is worth their while. Yes. If they can't make it to that release party, where else could they find your music at? Um, they will be able to get it at Urban Lights in St. Paul, um, The Electric Fetus in Minneapolis, mm -hmm. online, iTunes, and Amazon. All of the online music stores, right? Because we have a lot of young people followers, so they're probably yeah. like the electric. It's crazy. Fetus. I still, I still listen to CDs. <laughs> they're like that's a real store. So mm -hmm. wonderful. So tell us a little intro to Be You, and then we're actually gonna let you sing it so people okay. can hear you because it's beautiful. Okay. Yeah. So Be You is very, you know, the title is very self-telling, and um, it's just about about embracing who you are, and you know, we have these things about ourselves. We feel like we need to change because it doesn't fit the mold that we have. Um, whether it's a mold that culture, or society, or religion, or right. whatever has given us. So it's just like, no, you're cool just how you are. Good. So it goes like this. <clears throat> yes, I know how it feels to be on the outside looking in, never fitting in, they don't understand, no. Why you're not like them, but it takes a special kind of view to see life the way you do, yeah. And you can search the world high and low, there will never be another you, another you, no, no, no. In this heart, I know. But you got a heart of gold, and you, and you just want the world to know it's okay to be you, because you are different. You ain't like nothing of them. Said you got your own swag, your own style, your own thing. Baby, that's cool. It's written in the stars. 
You're supposed to be who you are. So do your thing, do your thing, do you, you. So it's okay to be you. And you were worried that you weren't going to be able to thank sing you. today. I have a cold. So <laughs> well, work. we thank you so much for coming on the show. We will share all of Ashley's contact information with you. We appreciate you for watching the show. Once again, you can find us on uh, Shaw Talk TV on YouTube, also on Instagram at Shaw Talk TV and Twitter at a hashtag Shaw Talk TV. <laughs>